Colorado Newborn Screening Virtual Education Series. Today's topic is hemoglobinopathies and endocrine disorders. As our virtual education sessions are designed to be interactive, we strongly encourage audience participation and all questions are welcome. Right now, everyone's microphones and cameras are muted. At the end of the presentation, I will unmute microphones and we will begin taking questions from our audience. Participants are also welcome to submit their questions via our group chat feature. A quick tips handout to include instructions on how to access group chat and submit questions was sent to all registered participants. Please allow me to now introduce our speakers for today's session. Dr. Aristides Maniatis with Rocky Mountain Pediatric Endocrinology, an assistant professor of pediatrics endocrinology with University of Colorado. Dr. Maniatis is also our first presenter today and will be joining us remotely. Dr. Jennifer Barker, Associate Professor, Pediatrics Endocrinology, Children's Hospital, Colorado. Dr. Rachel Nuss, Professor of Pediatrics Hematology Oncology and Bone Marrow Transplant with Colorado Sickle Cell Treatment and Research Center. And Donna Holstein, Hemoglobinopathies Educator for Colorado Sickle Cell Treatment and Research Center, University of Colorado. Thank you all for joining us today. Now let's begin. Dr. Maniatis, I am unmuting your camera and microphone right now. So please, free to begin. I have been officially unmuted, thank you. So uh, welcome everyone, thank you for joining us um, over your lunch hour. Uh, we're gonna start uh, uh, today with um, talking about congenital hypothyroidism. Uh, since I am remote, I'm gonna be saying next, um, so that my colleague over at Children's will be doing um, the forwarding of the slides. A disclosure, um, we do provide the initial consultation for abnormal newborn screens for Colorado and Wyoming. Next. So basically we wanna look at what the physiology of thyroid hormone is, understand congenital hypothyroidism, distinguish between two conditions, central and primary hypothyroidism, and really know how to interpret the lab values to make sure if it's a true state or maybe a pseudo disease state. Next. The um, axis of the uh, uh, hypothalamus, pituitary, and thyroid is as follows. The hypothalamus secretes thyrotropin-releasing hormone. That goes to the anterior pituitary gland. That uh, then secretes TSH, or thyroid-stimulating hormone, which goes to the thyroid gland to produce T4 and T3. Next. Looking at the timing. Um, in infancy, there's an initial TSH surge uh, within the first few hours after birth. And so the TSH will go really high in about 70 or so. And then preemies and very low birth weight infants often have a blood response and a relative immaturity of their access. Uh, next. So looking at the different types of hormone actions, really thyroid controls everything from metabolism to growth to puberty, temperature, bowel movements, hair, skin consistency, and mood. But what's really important for us um, in the newborn area is that it's critical for brain development, particularly under age three. And if it's not treated within the first 21 days of life, then this will result in permanent mental retardation. Next. The classic congenital hypothyroid patient um, is an infant that has a protruding tongue and some growth retardation, prolonged jaundice, um, dry skin, horse reflexes, uh, slow reflexes, hoarse voice, and kind of like an umbilical hernia, as you can see in this picture. But most babies look just like regular babies. Next. These symptoms are subtle and pretty easily missed, which is why the newborn screen is so important. So this heel prick test um, really is uh, to identify a time-sensitive treatable disorder um, that would otherwise be missed. And because treatment for congenital hypothyroidism is critical in the first 21 days of life, that's why it's so important that we make this diagnosis. In fact, congenital hypothyroidism is the most common disorder identified on the newborn screen with an incidence of about one in three to one in 4,000. Next, what are the causes of hypothyroidism? 
Next, we have several. The most common is that basically the gland didn't develop normally. So an agenesis or dysgenesis of the gland. Next, the gland may also have an, uh, a hormone synthesis issue. Um, these typically uh, have an autosomal recessive inheritance pattern and the infants will present with a goiter. Next, in addition, there might be some transient hypothyroidism. So this is where there's an immaturity in the gland often because of uh, prematurity. That we still treat until about age three because of the brain development issues. And then we can, of course, always reassess. Next. So newborn screening for congenital hypothyroidism. Next. The first screen is mandatory in all states. So we want to obtain it in the first 24 to 48 hours of life Remember of the TSH surge initially in infancy, so we don't want it to be too early within the first 24 hours because we may be having um, some false results there. Next. The second screen is available in many states, and ours is one of them in Colorado and Wyoming. Um, typically, we recommend it about two weeks of life, and we've had several additional second screen pickups. Um, that we would have missed on the first one in, ter in terms of infants with prematurity or very low birth weight and Down syndrome as well. Also, um, term infants that may have a decline in their thyroid function can also be picked up on this second screen. Next. So continuing our newborn screening, next, we're going to look at the um, protocols. So on the first screen, um, a total T4 is obtained first, um, and if it is low with an absolute value, less than six micrograms per deciliter, or less than the 10th percentile for the day of the run, then a TSH is obtained. Based on the TSH level, is stratified into kind of high risk or low risk category. So on the first screen, if the TSH is between 20 and 40, that's a borderline positive um, result and the state will contact the primary care provider. If the TSH on the first screen is greater than 40, that's a presumptive positive case that's more concerning. The state will contact Rocky Mountain Pediatric Endocrinology, and then we will contact the primary care with recommendations. On the second screen, the cutoffs are the same. A total T4 less than six or less than 10th percentile of the day with a reflex TSH. However, any level now that's greater than 20 is considered higher risk for presumptive positive, and the state will contact us to give further instructions. Next. And next. So we're going to do a couple cases. The first case is basically an infant that came in next with some newborn screen results. A total T4 is at four and a half. Uh, so that's less than six, so triggered the TSH reflex, and the TSH was elevated at 72. This was an appropriate collection because it was at day of life two, and so this was a presumptive positive case, and they contacted us for further evaluation. Next, so we talked to the primary care. The recommendation was to obtain uh, confirmatory serum levels with a free T4 and a TSH, and to, to start thyroid replacement therapy. Next, the confirmatory levels came back the next day and confirmed that the free T4, in fact, was low and the TSH was elevated. And then the patients to follow up um, with an endocrinologist based on the PCP preference and referral pattern, um, typically every six to eight weeks for the first year of life and then about three months from year one to three. Next. Our next case is looking next at a newborn now that had a low total T4 of four and a half. Again, six is our cutoff, but a TSH that was not elevated. It was less than 20. So because it was not an abnormal TSH, the, the state did not contact us, but because there was an abnormal T4, the primary care was contacted with general recommendations to redraw labs, and if there's additional information um, to follow up. Next. 
So the potential diagnoses in this scenario with a low total T4, but a TSH that's not high, include TBG deficiency and central hypothyroidism. These are very different conditions, one being benign and one requiring much more of an evaluation. Next. So for TBG deficiency, TBG is basically the albumin for thyroid. It's the carrier protein that carries T3 and T4. And so when it's bound to T3 and T4, it's a total level. And when it's not bound, it's a free level. Uh, the newborn screen obtains total T4 as our screens. With TBG deficiency, the total T4 will be low, but the free T4 is normal and the TSH is normal as well. This is often an X-linked condition and it's benign, asymptomatic, does not need treatment. Next. Central hypothyroidism, in contrast, is where you have an issue with the signaling with the hypothalamus or pituitary gland. You have a low total T4 and T3, both free and total. And the TSH, though, is not elevated because the TSH actually comes from the central process from the hypothalamus pituitary gland there, and so it's not elevated. This does require treatment and further evaluation of the pituitary axis um, that can control critical things like cortisol and growth hormone. Next. So in conclusion, what we're looking at with congenital hypothyroidism screening, uh, it's a low T4 and a high TSH. It's a critical condition, and we need to make an appropriate diagnosis with treatment within the first 21 days of life to prevent permanent mental retardation. Next. The total T4 levels, though, can be misleading with TBG deficiency. So for that reason, often a free T4 and TSH may need to be obtained if the total T4 is low. Next. A low total T4 with a normal TSH, I'm sorry, a low free T4 with a um, normal TSH or total T4 is concerning for central hypothyroidism, and this would be a condition that would require further evaluation. Next. That's it. Hope that was helpful. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Maniotis. We really appreciate you sharing your expertise. Okay, so now we are going to move on to our next presenter. Dr. Jennifer Barker. Hi, it's my turn to talk and we're going to move on to a different endocrine condition that is screened for in the newborn screen, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. I have no financial disclosures, but I should say Children's Hospital is contracted to provide the follow-up for um, newborn, positive newborn screens for congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And, um, so my objectives for the next 10 or 15 minutes is to describe what congenital adrenal hyperplasia is, and because that's a tongue twister, I'm just going to say CAH. We're going to discuss um, newborn screening for CAH and then the follow-up of patients who have positive screens for CAH. So this is um, the first thing that I want to describe to you all is what is CAH. So CH is an autosomal recessively inherited disorder of adrenal hormone synthesis. And I'm going to show you the pathway for adrenal hormone synthesis um, on the next slide. But what I want to point out on this slide is that there are many, there are several different enzymatic defects that can result in congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And we screen for one of those with the newborn screen. We'll get to that with the next slide. But because there are different spots where the enzymatic defect can occur, the patient may present with evidence for hormonal deficiency, such as aldosterone and cortisol deficiency, and hormonal excess. And the position of the, de of the defect will determine how the patient presents. Um, and this is why, I, this next bullet point is why I love endocrinology, because we treat with replacing the hormone that's missing. So with aldosterone, we replace the hormone with fludrocortisone, and with hydrocortisone, we, or cortisol deficiency, we replace that with hydrocortisone. So this is the adrenal steroid pathway. Um, it's near and dear to my heart because I had to memorize it for testing that I take, but I'm sure um, in the distant cobwebs of, of many other people who are listening to this, and that's okay. Um, what I want to show here is that there is um, a stepwise pathway for hormonal synthesis that leads to aldosterone um, on the left line 
cortisol in the middle line and androgens, which are on the far right. And the most common um, form of CAH is caused by um, inherited mutations in the 21 hydroxylase, um, the gene that encodes the 21 hydroxylase enzyme. So if a patient inherits these, a defect in these enzymes, um, they are no longer able to synthesize aldosterone and cortisol. And then imagine like a dam, you get a buildup of the hormones that are just above that, uh, where that enzyme acts. So you get an increase both in progesterone and 17-hydroxyprogesterone and an increase in the androgens, um, androstenedione. And um, this is important because what we're screening for with a newborn screen is 17-hydroxyprogesterone. -hydroxy That's what's tested for on the newborn screen. And the elevated androgens impact a developing fetus, 46XX fetus. Um, I'm just going to briefly review what cortisol does. Um, cortisol is important in the brain, pituitary, and bone. Um, in this, in, in this, these effects are mostly seen when cortisol is um, in excess, so we're not talking about that right now. What we're really talking about is what happens when there's a cortisol deficiency. So cortisol is really important for maintaining normal um, blood pressure. So with the cortisol, and it does this by increasing salt and water retention. So with a cortisol deficiency, you can get hypotension. And in metabolism, it acts both at the liver and the muscle to increase blood glucose. It acts at uh, metabolic pathways within the liver and the muscle. And with cortisol deficiency, patients can have hypoglycemia. So the impact of cortisol deficiency in a patient is can be low blood pressure and low blood sugar. Um, and this is the renin-aldosterone um, access. And so this is talking about how does aldosterone impact, um, what does aldosterone do in our body? So renin is released by the kidney, which is that, I don't know what shape that is, but it's supposed to look like the kidney in the middle of the diagram. And it's released in response to a decrease in renal artery pressure or a decrease in blood pressure. And then renin acts at angiotensinogen, which is uh, synthesized in the liver, um, and that causes the conversion of angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. And then angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2 um, by another enzyme that's produced by the lungs. And angiotensin 2 is actually the hormone that acts at the adrenal gland, which is represented by the triangle, to cause the release of aldosterone. Aldosterone acts directly at the kidney to increase sodium retention and increase potassium secretion. And with any time you hold on to sodium, water travels with it. So as you retain sodium, you retain water, the blood pressure goes up, and that stimulus for the release of renin um, is, is lifted. Um, so if somebody has aldosterone deficiency, um, they present with a low blood pressure, a low sodium, and a high potassium. That's what we're looking for when we look at the electrolytes. Prior to the newborn screen, how did CAH present? So in infants who, are 40, who have a karyotype of 46XX, you have virilization of the external genitalia. What does that mean? Well, on this diagram on the left of the screen, you can see um, a developing um, a grade, we call it prodder staging, um, from norm, totally normal appearing or typical appearing female genitalia on the left, all the way to a more typically appearing male genitalia on the right. And infants, 46XX infants with CAH can present with um, uh, differences in how their genitalia developed that is anywhere in sort of the middle of the spectrum. So very mild with just a mild increase in the size of the clitoris and fusion of um, the labia at the back, all the way to more severe where the phallic structure looks much less like a clitoris and more like a, a penis. In addition, in the internal organs are uh, affected um, where instead of having an outlet for both the bladder and the vagina, um, and the uterus, meaning the urethra and the vagina, is two separate openings. Th those openings can um, coalesce more 
um, inside the baby and have a single opening on the perineum. So it can have pretty significant impact on the external genitalia that would be apparent at birth of the baby. If the impact was more mild um, or subtle, the baby could have presented with a salt wasting crisis, which looks like low blood sugar, low blood pressure, low sodium, high potassium. But in infants who are 46XY, they already are producing a lot of androgens and have typically have a, a normal or typical appearing male genitalia. So they would not be identified on physical exam and often would present with a salt wasting crisis at three to four weeks of life and or um, present with sudden death. Um, occasionally CAH can present in childhood. We refer to this as non-classic and this presents with more evidence of the excess androgens with premature adrenarche, which means early pubic hair development um, and it evidence for um, acceleration of growth with both um, advancement of bone age and ultimately short stature. So why was CAH added to the newborn screen? I hope it kind of became apparent from what I described on the previous slide. So undiagnosed CAH was a cause of sudden infant death. There's a single screening test that can identify neonates with CAH and that's the 17-hydroxyprogesterone. Um, there's life-saving treatment that can prevent death, which is why it's life-saving. And um, additionally, there's time. So the salt-wasting crisis of CAH usually doesn't present right after birth, but closer to two to four weeks of age. So we have time when the positive screen comes back to do additional laboratory testing um, and consider initiation of treatment. What can cause false positives on the newborn screen for congenital adrenal hyperplasia? Well, premature neonates have higher 17-hydroxyprogesterone levels. Infants who are born small for gestational age also have higher 17-hydroxyprogesterone levels. And critically ill neonates often have higher 17-hydroxyprogesterone levels. So these are things that we will be thinking about when we um, evaluate our, our level of concern. Does this particular baby have congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Additionally, non-classic CAH, so this, the form of CAH that would typically present with early pubic hair can present on the, on the newborn screen, um, but it's not life-threatening and does not require treatment in the neonatal period. How common is CAH? So um, classical CAH, so the form of CAH that presents in the newborn period, occurs in about one in 15,000 live births. Prior to the advent of the newborn screen for this condition, the incidence was reported as one in 20,000. So we think that we were missing infants who had the disorder and, and unfortunately they probably died. Um, Non-classic CH is more common than classical CH. So how do we interpret the newborn screen? The results are presented here in nanograms per milliliter, which is different than the serum results that we'll get, which are presented, which are reported in nanograms per deciliter. I just bring your attention to that. You don't have to remember that, but as we're looking at laboratory tests in the next few slides, that becomes important. So you can see that um, positive results are classified either as borderline or presumptive positives. And presumptive positive um, occurs with a level um, for infants greater than 1,300 grams of greater than 125. And the borderline levels go down as the infants increase in um, birth weight because um, low birth weight is a confounder associated with higher levels. So what happens when an infant has a positive screen? The results are reported to pediatric endocrinology at Children's and to the primary care provider, and then we reach out to the primary care provider to ask for information about the infant, and then provide advice for follow-up of laboratory testing and clinical evaluation. What raises our concerns? So what are we going to be asking you? What, are there any abnormalities of the external genitalia? Is there any evidence for adrenal insufficiency, poor weight gain? Um, poor feeding, um, lethargy, and these of course are very hard to assess in a, in a tiny baby. And then once we obtain laboratory testing, our, our suspicion is going to be raised with a low sodium and a high potassium. When are we less worried? 
um, maybe ironically, we're less worried when the neonate is sicker because we expect those 17-hydroxyprogesterone levels to be a little bit higher in those infants. We're less worried in an infant who has typical female external genitalia, and we're less worried when the levels are in that borderline range. So depending on the degree of clinical suspicion, there's a few things that we may do. We may be request that the baby be followed by the primary care provider. We may say that the infant needs to go to the local emergency room for evaluation and laboratory testing. We may refer the patient to an outpatient or endocrinology for an urgent appointment. Or if the infant is preterm um, or ill, critically ill, have the patient continue to be monitored in the ICU. With a high clinical suspicion, patients will be started um, on treatment as confirmatory laboratory testing is pending. If any of you have walked down this path, you know that those, the confirmatory laboratory tests take up to a week to come back. And so we don't want patients untreated if they potentially could be at the point of having a salt wasting crisis. So we're gonna shift into just a couple of cases um, before we move on to the discussion, the next discussion of hemoglobinopathies. So this is a patient um, I actually took care of. Um, CB was a three-week-old neonate um, who was being followed by their primary care provider for poor weight gain. And on um, physical exam was noted to have hypospadias and undescended testes bilaterally. And I, the first newborn screen was quantity not insufficient, so did not have a result for the 17-hydroxyprogesterone. Um, and I was on call on a Saturday and received this phone call that the 17-hydroxyprogesterone on the newborn screen was very elevated and presumptive positive. And I nearly fell out of my chair because this baby was at an age where they could be having impending um, adrenal crisis. So we had the patient come to an emergency room. And um, this is a joke I put in because one of my children would always say, it's not a panic situation. And, um, but this is a situation in which um, this patient needs to be evaluated emergently. So they came to the emergency room and had um, evidence for an impending adrenal crisis with a low sodium and a high potassium, and all of the other laboratory testing was pending to come back in a week or so. And um, because of the influence of the excess androgens on the genitalia development, we were highly suspicious that this infant was a 46 had a karyotype of 46XX. So we sent that evaluation as well. So what's going on here? As I said, um, this patient is a 46XX infant with CAH, which resulted in severe virilization with a typical appearing penis, but there are clues on the physical exam that suggested a 46XX infant. That's the hypospadias and not, no palpable gonads. And if you remember one thing on uh, walking out of this from my portion of the talk, please remember that if a patient has hypospadias and no palpable gonads, this is consistent with the difference of sex development and requires emergent evaluation for congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Um, and the laboratory evaluation confirms CAH with a markedly elevated 17-hydroxyprogesterone and plasma renin activity, and the karyotype came back of 46XX. Um, the infant was symptomatic with poor weight gain, and they pre presented with adrenal crisis and potentially could have um, even died, um, but that was prevented by the newborn screen. This child is my patient. Um, she's now eight years old, and the family changed her gender assignment from male to female, and that's a much longer conversation. Okay, so case two we'll go through quickly because I don't want to um, impinge on other people's time. But this was a kind of a contrast. It was a two-week-old infant who was thriving and already back to birth weight. On exam, had very typical appearing male genitalia with their urethra at the tip of the penis and bilateral descended testes. Newborn screen number one came back mildly positive and or in the borderline range, as did the second. And so we performed laboratory testing which showed a normal sodium and potassium and a mildly elevated 17-hydroxyprogesterone with a normal plasma renin activity. So what are the next steps? What's going on here? All evidence points to a 46XX infant. The infant is asymptomatic. There's no evidence for salt wasting on laboratory testing with normal electrolytes and a normal renin. And so this patient really fits with non-classical CAH, and this diagnosis was confirmed. 
with genetic testing and ACTH stimulation testing. So now we're just following this cl child clinically for early puberty and it, the baby is, or the child now is on no hormonal treatment. So in summary, the most common cause of CH is screened for on the newborn screen with 17-hydroxyprogesterone. The risk for false positive increases with um, critically ill, preterm, and small for gestation in infants. And confirmation of positive screen requires laboratory testing. We may initiate treatment prior to results of confirmatory testing, depending upon the clinical scenario. And other more rare causes of CH are not typically identified on the newborn. So I'm Donna Holstein, and I do the follow-up for abnormal hemoglobins for both Colorado and Wyoming. This group of disorders is kind of different than the two we've talked about. Um, we are looking for specific disorder, sickle cell disease, but in looking for that, we find a lot of other disorders and a lot of traits. I'm going to kind of quickly go through how follow-up that works for that so that Dr. Ness can talk about sickle cell disease itself. I think it's always important. Um, I like to brag about Dr. Giffins every time I give a talk. In 1978, he founded the Sickle Cell Center and started universal newborn screening for hemoglobinopathy, looking for children with sickle cell disease in Colorado, which was a state that didn't have a very large minority uh, population at that time. I, it's speaks to the kind of person that he was. He got started then. Things took a long time, but now every state does universal screening. Previously targeted screening had been tested in many states and it was found to miss cases. So everyone does universal testing for sickle cell disease. The goal of newborn screening for sickle cell disease is we're looking for people, children who are born with two copies of the sickle gene or a sickle gene and a beta thalassemia gene where they don't make any normal hemoglobin. So a normal result for newborn screen is fetal and adult, F plus A. We are looking for the kids who come back on their first newborn screen as FS, no normal hemoglobin there. In our state um, and for Wyoming too, the all the samples get HPLC. If the HPLC is abnormal, the lab reflexes repeats the HPLC and then does isoelectric focusing. So basically two forms of hemoglobin electrophoresis are done on any sample that flags as abnormal for hemoglobin. And I'll talk a little bit more about how many abnormals there are. This is the genetics that we, of the kids that we're looking for. So both mom and dad in this pictogram have sickle cell trait. Every pregnancy, there is a 25% chance that this child got the S gene from each parent and has sickle cell anemia. So again, I'm just talking about kids whose newborn screens are FS, no A. Uh, and the reason that newborn screening is done for sickle cell is children can die of overwhelming bacteremia. Um, so by two months of age, every child in the United States has started on penicillin prophylaxis. If they are hemoglobin SS or S beta zero thalassemia, and the newborn screen looks the same for both of those disorders, FS, no A, you can do DNA testing down the road to distinguish between the two, or sometimes family testing has already been performed. Sickle cell disease is a relatively common orphan disease. About one of every 100,000 births in the U.S. are affected. About one in every 375 um, African-American babies is born with sickle cell disease. Importantly, in our population, one in every 1,200 Hispanic babies is born with sickle cell disease, um, but it can definitely be seen in all ethnicities, and we certainly have blonde hair, blue-eyed kids who are in sickle cell clinic. Sickle cell trait and sickle cell disease is not only in Africa. It's really anywhere where there's malaria, um, so all, all around the equator and wherever your ancestors come from can lead you to carry that gene. 
uh, while we're looking for SS, we find other kinds of sickle cell disease, such as SC disease, where one parent had a sickle gene, one parent had a hemoglobin C gene, and they both passed those on. So here are the major diseases that we're looking for. Again, sickle cell anemia, SC disease, sickle beta plus thalassemia, which means that on your newborn screen you have a little bit of A, that gene is not completely broken, uh, sickle D disease and sickle E disease. Basically anything, a sickle gene with some other variant where there's no normal hemoglobin. We're also looking for beta thalassemia major, which is F and no A or very, very little A on newborn screen. We find other variant diseases, hemoglobin E, C, D, and uh, hemoglobin H disease with a large amount of BARTs present on HPLC. So what happens when one of those disorders is called out? So the, the state calls me and tells me, for instance, there's a child who's born and first newborn screen is FS, no A. So I contact the PCP and or the family. I try to always start with the PCP. Make sure the second screen is scheduled and the kid's being seen by someone. Second screen gets drawn and those report, that result is again called to me. And again, I reach out to the PCP and the family and facilitate them coming to Children's Hospital for more testing and lots of teaching. Um, and Dr. Ness will talk about that a little bit more. While we're looking for sickle cell disease, we also find many traits. Um, roughly seven to 800 are identified in the two states over a year. The most common is sickle cell trait, and that newborn screening result is F, A, and S. For all traits, I do not contact the families directly. I send letters to the PCP um, and always to the PCP listed on the second newborn screen, which is very helpful that our state continues to do the second. And importantly in Colorado, about 30% of those kids identified with sickle cell trait are of a Hispanic background. I'm just gonna go through this quickly, but there's other things found, FAU, which just means that this is a variant that we do not have a control for, um, FA. C, FAD, FAE, again, all of those get letters sent to the PCP and handouts for the PCP to talk to the family about the trait status. And kids with disease, again, are referred to the hemoglobinopathy clinic to see Dr. Nuss, and now she will continue the talk. Okay, so children with hemoglobinopathies of significance or potential significance are referred to our clinic, which is the regional clinic. There we will see children whose results have shown FS, FSC, et cetera, as shown above. What we do in the clinic is look at the results of the newborn screen and we confirm the diagnosis. We will also clarify the diagnosis, although Donna mentioned that F and S usually indicates sickle cell anemia or sickle beta zero thalassemia. It may indicate sickle high persistent fetal hemoglobin, which is a much, much, much milder entity and doesn't require similar care as the children with the more severe diseases. Once we establish the diagnosis, we indicate the clinical implications and we will send a game plan for management to the primary care doctors. And the reason that we're doing all this is to reduce the morbidity and mortality associated with sickle cell disease. On this graph, if you look at the red line, you will see that in the first 18 years of life or so, still two to 4% of children with sickle cell disease in the United States die and our goal is to prevent those deaths. At the first visit, we will try to determine what the families understand about the diagnosis. Have they ever heard of sickle cell? Do they have members in their families that have been affected? We repeat the testing if the family desires. 
and we will obtain DNA analysis if necessary. Extensive education is provided by a nurse and doctor. Children who have the SS or S beta zero thalassemia type of sickle cell disease are started on prophylactic penicillin, which is in continued until they are five years of age or forever if they undergo splenectomy in the future. We reinforce that immediate care is required. If the child has a fever of 101 or greater, the child must be seen, blood cultures must be obtained, a CBC has to be obtained, and the child is given broad spectrum antibiotics. This is because the children are at risk of overwhelming sepsis due to splenic infarct. The other major risk for early death is a splenic sequestration crisis. That is when the spleen literally sucks all the blood out of the body and the child dies. We make sure that the families have all of our contact information. We advise them to seek care in our infusion center Monday through Friday during business hours. Off hours would be the emergency room. They are given a magnet that instructs when to call. We make sure families have thermometers. We also supply a book written for parents of children with sickle cell disease. Families are given handouts. And because this is a very complex disease, we have a social work assessment to determine whether the family has transportation, whether they do have insurance, whether they have housing, whether they have food, all of those things so that they can get their child the appropriate care. We will also discuss additional prophylactic measures. For example, children with sickle cell disease are at high risk for having a stroke. Transcranial Doppler is a very useful tool for determining which children are at the highest risk for having stroke. We talk about future potential prophylactic medications. There are two that are approved in the U.S. That is hydroxyurea and Andari, which is L-glutamine. We also discuss supplementary vaccines because the children have reduced immunity. And of course, every family who comes wants to know if this disease can be cured, which it can. So we do a brief discussion of bone marrow transplant, and now we're looking at the potential of gene therapy as curative. We see the children every three months for the first year, every six months thereafter, and we continue to do education, evaluation, treatment, planning. Any questions? Okay, we're going to <clears throat> proceed with opening up the room to questions. If anyone has any, I am actually unmuting microphones right now. Please feel free to chime in with any questions that you have. Dr. Hutt, I do see that you joined us today. Thank you so much. Do you have any questions for us? Hi, Dr. Mokra Heisky. Thank you for joining us. Do you have any comments for our uh, speakers today? Well, I, this is Jesse Hutt in Durango. I guess I have some questions about whether one with the hemoglobinopathy screen, does it give you the percentage of S, A, and F? Also, does it help in diagnosing thalassemias, telling you about how much beta 2 there is? Well, you, you can't diagnose beta thalassemia from a newborn screen. So you can recognize hemoglobin H disease, and you might guess at an alpha thal trait, but you wouldn't be able to diagnose any beta thalassemia off of the newborn screen, other than to say someone had sickle beta plus thalassemia, or with FS, maybe S beta zero, and then if the child was microcytic. So, Dr. Hutt, the hemoglobin electrophoresis that the state does is qualitative, not quantitative. Okay. But the hemoglobins are reported in order of quantity. 
So as long as you have that A in front of S or C or any of the alphabet soup, it's a trait. It's when there's no A or the A is last that you have potentially have a disease. Great, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Head. Do we have any other questions from anyone? All microphones are currently open, so please feel free to provide any questions or comments that you have about today's session. Are patients with uh, inherited thyroid problems uh, and sickle cell uh, routinely referred for genetic counseling? So I can speak to the hemoglobinopathies. We have genetics counselors in our clinics um, twice a month to meet with families. Um, I, I guess I'll, um, I don't, is Dr. Maniatis on the, on the talk anymore? Cause I can, can okay. you hear me? Yeah, yeah, there you go. So yeah, for the thyroid conditions, I think if, if we have a, uh, a strong familial history of an inheritance pattern and a goiter, often we will go further to do confirmatory genetic testing, um, on that, uh, disorder so we can kind of, quanti um, uh, uh, characterize it better. And then in terms of further genetic testing, usually we say, you know, if it's an autosomal recessive pattern, it's a, the, the typical 25% risk, but we don't go into further testing on my end because now we're talking about reproduction, uh, further reproduction for other um, infants um, for sibling risk. So that's typically what I do on my end. Um, Jen, did you want to comment maybe on the children's side there? I, I think, um, well, I don't really have much to add related to the, the hypothyroidism. I would agree if we have a family history, we will offer genetic testing, although it, that really doesn't change what we do for the patient. So in some sense, the family can decide if they want to do the treatment or not. Um, I will just say, although you didn't ask, um, for congenital adrenal hyperplasia, we offer all families genetic testing and they sequence the gene that um, encodes to the 21 hydroxylase enzyme and that can be useful for future pregnancies. Um, so, so certainly to risk stratify and, and um, screen those pregnancies to know if that infant uh, or the fetus has, um, has congenital adrenal hyperplasia. It, you know, as with anything, families often are, aren't are interested, um, but some are. So, so we'll offer it. And then certainly if they have questions, we would refer for genetic counseling if they want to have the whole family tested. Also for a follow-up of patients with these endocrine disorders or sickle cell problems, are we using uh, telemedicine for patients and families in remote areas? Well, for sickle cell, because of our altitude, the families pretty much live uh, in the Denver Metro, Colorado Springs area because it can't tolerate the higher altitude. For um, genital hypothyroidism, I, I don't do uh, telemedicine for any of our patients currently. Um, we also will follow some, at Children's, will follow some patients with congenital hypothyroidism and, um, and as does Aristides follow patients with CAH. Um, we have some opportunity for um, telemedicine. Um, it's not, and, and also we have um, faculty who travel across the state and up into Wyoming to see patients. Um, I mean, we certainly do have some families that drive hours and hours to come see us. Um, some of the evaluation that we do, like a pubertal exam, um, can be challenging to do um, via telemedicine. That's mostly pertinent for um, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And from hemoglobinopathy, we do provide support to doctors who are up in Montana and a few doctors in Wyoming. 